<coughs> yeah, while it loads up, um, I mean, I don't really have anything prepared um, because um, <coughs> yeah, I live quite a lot on the island of fear. Um, it's quite, I think I was invited to this. It's quite an integral part of my, um, my work um, as an artist. And, I hope to answer your question about if it's possible to express horror in a digitized world. Um, um, I absolutely do, and it's, it's very much part of um, how I conceive of myself as an artist and the kind of work that I respect from other artists. Um, I'll just check what time it is. Uh, yeah. um, I'd like to start out with the, the very first introduction and certain um, the way we were introduced and certain things which always tend to, to bother me, um, certain assumptions which fly around in such kinds of situations, which is this kind of speaking, this, the way we're discussing we, this world, our world, um, and I was born and I grew up in South Africa during the time of apartheid, and I have a very different experience um, of the world. So for instance, you spoke that the, the Cold War never burst out. Well. That's not true. It may not have burst out in Europe, but it burst out in Africa. The United States was fighting Russia in Angola through with the, the Cubans were there, the Russians were there, the Americans were there, and the South Africans were, were there. And that was not a low intensity conflict. That was a, that was a war, a full out war. Um, when I was a kid, every white man was conscripted and would go into the war and fight with machine guns and kill people for the Cold War. So. You know, and you know when there's this, there's a kind of certain assumption about Europe as a safe place. Well, the world is a very big world, and it's not all safe. Um, um, and you, you, I forget if it was you or, 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 or the when you were talking about a new type of warfare in the world. I don't think there's a new type of warfare at all. I mean, I think that what, that what happened on the 11th of September was a logical conclusion of something that's been happening in the world since the French Revolution. Um, it's not a new type of warfare at all. It's just now in the news. Um, when there was um, half a million people killed in Rwanda, we didn't say it's a new type of warfare. It didn't even make the news. You know? um, then somehow it fell into the news, and we didn't take much attention to that. That was half a million people. But when 2,500 people die in the World Trade Center, now it's a new type of warfare. The numbers don't add up for me, you know, um, and it's, it's, it brings to the, the, the question of, um, let me just get this thing going. I mean, for me, it's a, it becomes a question of not fear, um, because fear is something that I work with in my work, but I guess more the question of terror and how terror manifests and why terror should manifest um, and how terror can be used as a very positive tool, how the fear of fear for me is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And it's something that, that, that uncanny, that, that with the, um, the, the death, with, with, with you were talking about, that Heidegger talks about the sublime, um, is something which for me as an artist is extremely productive because of the world that I'm living in, um, having been born in South Africa. And I'm just going to run through images. And, yeah, um, having been born in South Africa and um, from Dutch descent. My, I was born Jacobus Hermanus Peter Geert which is the name of my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, who went to South Africa from Holland. Um, and the way I conceive of myself as a Frankenstein of a genetic engineering experiment, it was the Dutch who went to South Africa, set up the social system of apartheid. Even the person who legislated apartheid in 1948 was first-generation Dutch. Hendrik Verboot was born in Holland, was educated in Holland. He wasn't third, third or fourth generation. Um, so, I start with, I mean, for this discussion, I'm going to start with this particular work, um, Self-Portrait, which I made in 1995, because it exemplifies a lot of my thinking of how I conceive of myself as a person and as an artist. So, we all know what Heineken is, yeah. Um, I don't have to introduce to you the Heineken. Uh, which is a beer, which is made in Amsterdam, made perfectly well put into perfectly well-designed bottles, which some designer decided green makes it better, um, the shape, the color, the, everything about it is designed to make you have pleasure from the beer. Then it gets sent around the world and people drink it, and then something else happens, something changes. 
And I'm interested in the point where something stops functioning, where that fear of fear itself starts to kick in, when it doesn't have a reason to exist anymore. It doesn't have a, a, a valid function. The form doesn't the design and the form doesn't follow the function. So um, in Africa, I mean, people drink Coca-Cola when they're finished with the can out of necessity. They cut the can up and they make toy cars, which they can sell. They, make, they, they recycle things out of a necessity, not because it's politically correct, not because they're trying to save the planet, not because it's ecological, but because they can't afford anything else. And that process of recycling becomes an interesting one. So once the beer arrives in South Africa, now this particular bottle, of course, I bought it in Johannesburg with big red letters, imported, like myself. My ancestors were imported into South Africa, which the emphasis on the word imported in South Africa for the beer and for the identity is because one grows up there with a huge insecurity complex. You are taught that everything imported is superior to anything local. And that's not just the beer, it's the culture, it's everything, it's the art, it's the food, it's... it's and of course a pizza from Italy tastes better than sausages from Johannesburg. Of course beer from Holland tastes better than beer from Johannesburg. Um, and it's not necessarily... it's where, and I think you, you kind of were talking about it, where your culture creates your taste, your culture creates your, your, your value system, your culture creates your language. So what you cannot say doesn't exist. So you get predetermined, pre-coded by the world that you're born into. Your morals are not your morals. Um, because, for instance, growing up in South Africa, in 1990, we had a very, I lived through a very extraordinary event, um, which is, the release of Nelson Mandela, the end of, some say the end of the Cold War, but certainly the end of apartheid, at the same time as the, the, the Berlin Wall coming down. Um, and in January 1990, South Africa was full of white racists. But by April 1990, they disappeared. The country's moral system changed fundamentally. What was good became evil, and what was evil became good. Nelson Mandela went to jail for 27 years for being a terrorist. His charge was terrorism because he made a decision in 1969, together with many other people. Up until that point, they'd been following the anti apartheid struggle, they'd been following the system of Gandhi, which was passive resistance, which was, um, yeah, we know the system of Gandhi. But in 1969, there was a protest in Sharpeville, and people were burning their, their identity documents. Um, and the police basically opened fire. And most, and the, pe the, 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 the people were fleeing, running away, and a lot of them were shot in the back. A very famous image. And on that day, it had decided to form in controversies where the armed struggle, um, the spirit of the nation. And Mandela went to jail because he was supporting violence as a means of social change, which is the position that I'm coming from as an artist and as a person who grew up as an activist in South Africa, is that passive um, resistance does not work. You need to change the world with fire. You need to change the world with violence. It's the only thing that where people take notice. It's the system that they decided in, in, in with Malcolm X, with the Black Panthers. It's the system that the IRA, uh, the same conclusion the IRA arrived at, the, the PLO. Um, it's I mean the world. There's many examples of people who have decided that violence is the is the only acceptable form of of change. Um, so how do I get there? Oh yes, I mean talking about. Um, because we're all embodied in, in, in a system which, it, a system where um, power is predetermined in the sense of our language, the words we can use to speak, the history that we've given, um, our value system, our culture, everything is given to us and we assume that it's complete. We assume that because it's written important, therefore it's better, which is not necessarily the case. Um, history. We assume, because we taught at school, history exists like that, therefore that must be correct. Um, well, I was taught that in 1652, Jan van Riebeek came from Holland and discovered South Africa. Now, when children go to school, they taught that on the 16th of April, 1652, Jan van Riebeek came and colonized South Africa. Um, there was a very famous example of what was always called the Battle of Blood River. I think it's on the 31st of May, which was the Boers were in an encampment between two rivers and they had their lager, and they were being attacked by thousands of Zulu warriors, and they prayed to God, and they said, Dear God, if you save us from these savages on this day, we promise to always keep the faith and keep this day sacred for all eternity. And so many Zulu people were massacred on that day that it was called the Battle of Blood River because the waters turned red. And this was interpreted as a sign from God, that God was on their side. 
rather than the fact that they had guns, and the Zulus were trying to wade through um, um, running water, but um, a, a very strong current. Um, but it was celebrated in our history as a day of triumph. Now, of course, I was a white person in a white school with a government education. Today, if you go to a school, that same event is taught, and it's called, the, 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 the day is still kept as a holiday, but it's now called the day of mourning. It's now considered a day of genocide. So, history is written by the winner. History is not a fact, who wins and who loses, it's, it, it changes. So you can't believe in history, you can't believe in language. I don't believe we can believe in morality because I was taught Nelson Mandela was the Antichrist and then I was told he's a god. So which one is he? Um, um, yeah. So, to go back to the self-portrait. Um, so once the bottle arrives, the ideology arrives, the system arrives, the design arrives in Africa, you use it for what it's been used for, then you throw it away, then it breaks. And it's a discontinued history. It, becomes a, it, ha it develops a new discontinued fun function. And the imported bottle then becomes something very dangerous, something extremely violent. Anybody who's ever been in a bar fight or in a football brawl knows that if you get cut by that, it's very difficult to stitch you back together. So then, to always go back to the subject of fear, I mean, what becomes very interesting for me is when you, get, when you go and travel on any airline these days, and particularly if you go to the United States, the humiliation of take off your shoes, take off your belt, have you got a nail clipper, they'll confiscate your nail clippers, that you can't, you, they don't give you knives and forks, cutlery on the aeroplane because they think you're going to hijack the aeroplane. And yet they serve you wine. All you've got to do is break a, a, a bottle of wine and you've got one of the most violent weapons known to the human animal. I mean, it's completely fake. You, you know, when you're walking through those stupid metal detector machines, it's, it's only for your own well-being. You think you're being protected, which is absolute nonsense. Um, you're not. I mean, it's very easy to hijack an aeroplane if you really want to. Just open the door. Yeah? You'll kill at least 20 people by opening the door, and maybe another you know, 20 will have a heart attack. And, <laughs> and the other thing about the, why the, I'm intrigued by the self-portrait and conceiving of myself in this way is because in South Africa, it's also an object of extreme pleasure. Um, such an object is known as a bottleneck. You put a piece of cardboard in the, in the not the, glass, the broken part, but the other part, and you stuff it with marijuana, and you smoke it, and you have an extreme high. Um, so it's conceiving of myself in the idea of extreme pleasure and extreme pain at the same time. And no, I'm not afraid of pain. I mean, for me, pain is a very healthy thing. You only, there's, a, one, there's that fantastic film called Drugstore Cowboy, where I think it's Matt Dillon, I can't remember the actor. He says, the most life-affirming moment is when you're having the shit being kicked out of you. And he was, he was um, you know, it's, I think pain is a very interesting um, thing, which, um, which, which, which I try to use in my work. So Mondo Kane um, was in a way the, the next step from the, the bottleneck, the, the self-portrait made almost 10 years later, um, made it's a perfect cube, one meter by one meter, made in concrete and glass. The old-fashioned way of um, making walls. Uh, when I grew up in South Africa, around the walls, they had these like, cute little low-rise walls with concrete and glass on top. Um, as security, um, so that you didn't enter the premises. And again, I think it was purely psychological. The fear was, it, it functions as a sign. It functions as an embodiment of an ideology that you think that's going to keep you safe. Um, of course, ten, five years after that, um, then it was the, 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 the glass on the walls became cute and quaint. So now we had to then put barbed wire, and then you, you continue um, a couple of years after, and it's going to be an electric fence. Um, then eventually, now if you go to Johannesburg, it's a military zone. Around every house is these huge high walls and um, electric fence and private security guards and still 20,000 people are murdered every year and 60,000 women are raped every year. So the security clearly doesn't work. Um, but, so that's the, the kind of reality side of it. Um, but my reflection on it is, okay, taking the, 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 the point of history, taking the point of art history, this bourgeois logic, this... Um, I, I conceive, I think of the art system as the perfect um, embodiment of the capitalist value system. We don't go to church anymore, we don't have any beliefs anymore, and where the capitalist faith becomes physical is in art. And it's very clear now, um, as prices are going out of control, um, and, and the art system is, um, I think, absolutely rampant, I think it's a very clear expression of a certain kind of value system. And it is very much a European Western value system, it's not a universal system at all. Um, art doesn't really function outside of Europe um, and the United States. Um, 
So I take the, the socle de monde of Piero Manzoni, or the one meter cube of Donald Judd, the canon of minimalism, and introduce into it a danger principle, introduce into it broken glass, which you can, you can get hurt. I mean, some of my works are life-threatening um, and very difficult to exhibit because it's about a process of accepting responsibility. It's about a process of returning to this question of the individual. When you cross the road, you take responsibility. You look left and you look right and you don't walk in front of the bus. When you meet somebody in a bar, you, one thing leads to another thing and you're going to get down to some dirty fun. You decide to use a condom or not use a condom. These are life-altering decisions which you take and you take your responsibility for. Yet when you walk into an art gallery, you become completely passive. You walk around with your stupid glass of wine and your hands behind your back looking at the things on the wall with a completely passive engagement with it, which is something which what I try to do in my, my the, I've written uh, a number of texts on the concept of terror realism, which you can read on my website. And the idea of terror realism is where you take responsibility for yourself and how you as the viewer are constructed in language, power, identity, morality, and how your construction is played out in that space of the art gallery. Um, and the work which is called The Forest of Suicide, taken from um, Dante's Inferno, which is the place where they send people who commit violent crimes, rape and murder. Um, it was a labyrinth that made in Rome, um, with the same kind of the same broken glass, very dark, and you walk through the labyrinth. Um, but the, 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 I guess the important thing that I'm trying to say when, I, when one talks about accepting responsibility, and one of the frustrations that many people have with my work is that um, I do consider my work to be political, but my definition of politics is very different than a conventional definition of politics. Um, if I was making art or posters um, or making pieces which was like um, George Bush is a fascist, which I believe he is, but if I was advertising my political opinion about George Bush, I'm simply announcing my opinion, like saying I have two arms, two legs, George Bush is a fascist. And what makes me as an artist so arrogant as to assume that my political opinion is worth more than yours? There was a time in Germany when the Nazis were politically correct, internally. There was a time when to be racist in white South Africa was politically correct for some people. Then it changed. Now, how can one go about, um, for me, artists are not equipped to make those kinds of announcements of who you should vote for, who you should not vote for, or me simply announcing whom I voted for achieves absolutely nothing other than telling the whole world whom I voted for. The audience then will be divided with those who agree with me. Yes, I also agree George Bush is a fascist, and those who disagree with me. But nothing changes. Whereas when you're inserting your audience into a very complex moral space where there is the risk, the danger of um, physically harming yourself, be it psychological or be it... Uh, installed in, in Johannesburg in um, 94, an electric fence of 6,000 volts, um, which you could touch if you really had the desire. Um, it was not protected and it was open, it was about respecting. Where, when you insert your viewer into an ideologically, morally complex space, the viewer ends up going through that process of panic internally, where the viewer goes, has to confront what do they think. Where you're, where you're being challenged by your opinion, and then you go through a process of transformation. When you're confronting your own sense of death, your own morality, your own body space where your body can be penetrated by the work of art, mm -hmm. you then think about the work of art differently. You think about your body differently. Um, and for me, that's what makes a work of art political. Not simply announcing, not simply advertising my political opinion. Codex was a work I made in, 90, in 2003. Former, um, former civilizations, together with um, Buddhist or Christian, things which floated up onto the flea market, including a real skeleton. Um, and asking the question about faith in today's world. We, we're not afraid. We don't have fear. It's a very complicated thing today because we, we, we're not afraid. I mean, you spoke about the end of... People don't have a meta metaphysical sense of the world anymore. Um, what they're afraid of is crazy Muslims, which is a... I mean, I think we had a very good explanation as to why that's a very strange fear to have. Um, but I think one of the reasons why art is in such a dire way, and I think the reason why people like George Bush can exist, is because we don't believe in anything metaphysical anymore. 
because the gods of the past have been destroyed. Um, and this particular piece, it was closed. You, this, this, the, the view that you have now was only is possible with a camera. It was closed. It's a, it's a perfect cube, five meters by five meters and three meters high, with industrial shelving and all these gods looking internally at themselves, looking internally on, a, on an empty space. And you as the viewer, were, you were excluded and you had to walk around it. So it's, and in form, it, it's not unlike the, the Kaaba in Mecca, which is also a black box with, um, where Muhammad cast um, a number of evil spirits to, into that box, and also an asteroid, um, which is one of the huge mysteries for me of the, of the Muslim faith, is that the, at the center of it is an asteroid. Um, then I had an exhibition in New York in, 90, in 2003, um, and I showed this particular piece called Acropolis Now, with, um, I think, yeah, you can, there's another version of it which I showed in Athens, uh, Acropolis Redux. Uh, with this particular material, which um, is very dangerous, um, razor wire, razor mesh, um, which is exactly the same material. When I showed this in the, the piece in New York, um, Acropolis Now, um, we actually had to wait to get the, the material supplied because of the war in Iraq. It had to subside somewhat because it was being exported all to Iraq. It's exactly the same material that they use um, to build the fence in Palestine. Um, it's basically it's an, it's, a, it's the, the descendant of barbed wire. Um, it, you can get it all over the world if you just have to look hard enough. Um, razor wire is for cattle and cows and animals and um, farms, whereas razor mesh is for humans because once it, it, it it's literally little razor blades, um, and when they catch your skin, they, they, they penetrate and it holds on. Um, and with this particular piece of Acropolis now, sort of using the, the, the columns of the Acropolis, uh, asking the question of faith, asking the question of what do we believe in today, in a time of war, um, in a global civil war. Ah, that was the other thing I wanted to say, is that you spoke about there being no longer borders. Um, perhaps if you're Dutch, there's no longer borders. But if you're South African, or if you're Palestinian, or if you're coming from um, Argentina, I assure you there are borders. And when I arrive with a South African passport into the European Union, I am interrogated as to my intentions every single time. I have never been felt more excluded from the world than the present. So borders are only not there for certain people. We'll come back with that. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and the idea, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I work with the idea of borders very often in my work. Now, this particular material fascinates me because um, it's an African material. And I think of it very much in South African terms. Why? Because the first time in a war conflict where barbed wire was used, humans against humans, was by the British against the Boers in South Africa in the Boer War in 1898. Those were the first concentration camps in the world, and that was the first time that barbed wire was used for a war. During the time of apartheid, this particular technique was invented by a South African company called Cochrane Steel, who now holds the world patent for this material. So when you see it in Iraq or Palestine or anywhere in the world, it's coming from a license from South Africa, so it is entirely an indigenous African material. Um, but it, it functions, uh, these slides are not, don't really give you a good sense of it. Um, it functions very much at a level, and, and it's something which I try with a, with a, number, with a lot of my work, um, is it's extremely beautiful to look at. It's extremely attractive. It draws you in like a moth to the fire. And yet it's extremely ugly to think about. So when you have the knowledge of the material, when you have the knowledge of what it's being used for, it's extremely ugly. But at the same time, it's unbelievably aesthetic. And it's, it's that moment which, um, which, for me, what I would strive for, is you're driving down the road, and there's a car crash, and there's glass on the floor, and you stop your car and you look. Why? Why do you stop? Why do humans stop and look at something like that? It's an affirmation of life. It's a warning. It's a celebration that you're not dead. It's you're looking for the blood, but you're afraid to see it. You're looking to see that somebody died, but you're also afraid. So it's that attraction and repulsion which happens at the same time. Um, yeah. yeah, the concept of good and evil. Um, it's a mural I made, which is... Um, the word live and the word evil are exactly the same. They're just a mirror of each other. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll stop shortly and then take some questions. Um, but this is a work I made for Zurich called Terror Realismus. And on the outside of it, uh, you know, so, okay. on the outside you basically have three, no, it, yeah, three meter high walls with the glass from floor to ceiling. And then you enter into the space and you have this kind of very rough um, concrete installation with three neon signs that are broken. 
So you have the word danger, but the letter D is flickering. It's not flickering like advertising, it's broken, so it's going on and off like an electrical shortfall. So danger becomes anger, order becomes order, and terror becomes error. Um, which is from a series of works um, I made. Um, I was invited to show in the United States um, on an exhibition which was thinking about the, the World Trade Center, and my response was this neon, which is the word slaughter and laughter, which co-inhabit the same word. Um, revolution of the word love inside it um, for, an, for, an ex um, for a permanent installation in, in Tuscany. Um, and for the Villa Medici outside the Vatican, I installed a neon sign that said believe, but lie was flickering and broken. Um, which is one of the reasons why it takes to my question about how power manifests in language and how fragile languages are and how the concepts of good and evil are being played out in our sense of why do we assume good is white and evil is black? Why do we have these value systems which are built on very ancient and the, the, the fears of our forefathers have created our morality, have created our system, have created our faith of today um, and they deposited their fears into our language, preventing us, giving us access to what you can and what you cannot say. And anybody who's had a lover from another language knows what I'm talking about, where you, you, you have that emotion on the tip of your tongue, you know exactly what you're feeling, but you cannot explain it to a person in another language. Um, I think I'll stop there, um, and because it's been yeah, a while, and then take some questions, and then if you want to see more work, we can show you more work as well. <coughs> Thank you very much. Urgent questions? Do you have one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, How do you relate your, your oh. for recording? Oh. How do you relate this uh, later work with the uh, language to the class works and via works before? I made them in a different name. The, wor the glass works I make under my own name, Kendall Gears, but the neon works I make under the name Colab. K O Lab. Why? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but how do you relate them? How do I relate them in what sense? Well, are they a, con a continuation of the same uh, language you're using? As yes, indeed. Language? I mean, I mean, okay, let's say the, 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 the glass cube, the title is Mondo Carne. Um, you know, the, I think that the, the, the naming of things, the titling of things was an is, an, is an extremely important part of my process. Um, for the first years of my, my, my life as an artist, I used to call things title with help, um, where the idea was, instead of saying untitled, you make it political. There is a title, but I'm not giving it to you. Um, so language manifests as a form of power. And in the naming of things, so Mondo Kaine is, um, there, are, there are two things which I'm quoting, um, and the one is the, the, the Italian film, which was called Mondo Kaine, which won a, I think it was in 1969, it won an Oscar for the best documentary, and it was the first shockumentary film. Um, after that you had films like Faces of Death, which was, which was Mondo Kaine was the first film where they showed you people dying on film. So it was the time of the Vietnam War, and you had the people pouring, petrol over themselves and setting themselves alight, and then they showed people in Africa being eaten by crocodiles, and it was the idea of where the shock became entertainment. Um, and it incidentally was also the film which probably was responsible for the, um, the heart attack of Yves Klein, because he sought in, in, in Khan, and he walked out, and, and because he, they, for, they also showed some things like Yves Klein's performance. <coughs> and he was so shocked to see his performance in that context that he had a heart attack, literally, um, and then died. And the other film I was referring to was Citizen Kane. So the K is, the, is this from Citizen Kane. Um, and I use a lot of spelling mistakes in my work, using a K instead of a C or Terrorismus. Or, um, the titles become a way of quoting or pointing you in a direction of other references, cultural references, physical references. Um, and the neon works, the, the works with text, are more playful. Um, because I think, on the one hand, I, a lot of my work deals with terror as a subject, but also as an object and a, and a process. But the other thing that's very important is humor. You know, the idea of the trickster. It's for me very important. And how the trickster can function um, with, the, with the black humor, the, the, the slaughter laughter thing. 
is very important that 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 by that double thing between change one letter and it fundamentally changes and the, the importance of laughter, the importance of, of black humor. Um, and so the, the, the neon works, the, the text works more the light side of my work and the, the you know the, the, the bombs and the guns and the there's more the dark side. Um, and it's important for me to have the both. Um, it's important for me to make that balance. Thank you. Are there any more urgent questions? Hi, you were saying that um, this kind of art, as we see it, doesn't really exist out with uh, the Western world. Um, did you not say something similar to that? No? Something similar, yeah. Yeah, what did you say? <laughs> Can you expand on that? Um, I took notes. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I said a few things uh, about the Western world. and um, We go back to the question of imported from Holland. Now, one of the problems of being an artist from Africa or from South America or from any third, let's say, third world context, and that's a complicated term, um, but let's say somebody from the outside, is that one of the theories I try to develop in my theory of terror realism is that when you get taught to speak, they say we, I'm taught in Johannesburg how to speak English, um, your accent becomes very important how you speak English because the world is created in such a way that your point of measurement is the Queen in, in London. She is the perfect English. And your proximity to that determines your effectiveness in being able to master the tongue, being able to speak um, perfectly. And the greater your accent, the more you are marginalized from being normal. Now, from an art point of view, yeah, you can make what you want in Johannesburg. You can, you, can, you, can be, you can call yourself an artist, you can have exhibitions, but it doesn't count until it returns to the center where it gets judged according to the Queen's English, we would say in English, in, in, in English, until it gets judged according to that canon and that model, and once it goes through that system, then it enters into the, the perspective, the vision of the, the, the power brokers, the gatekeepers of contemporary art. Because until those power brokers say, you exist, it doesn't matter what you're doing in the jungle, it doesn't matter what you're doing in Johannesburg, so that the, the, the art world is very much centered in Europe and the United States. And probably even, I would say, Europe and New York. Um, even the United States is um, a more complex space. Um, and the sense of inclusion or exclusion is very strong. And how one, and then it becomes interesting for me, how do you negotiate that process of being assimilated? Because it becomes a point of contact and points of resistance. Now it's very easy to, I, there's always, from a colonial point of view, there's the idea of the, the good native and the bad native. The good native is the one who is the houseboy who does his job and does everything perfectly. The bad native is the one who steals your cows. And the bad native for me is the model, the trickster, who you need your point of contact, so you need to be able to speak the good English, but your level of accent becomes a point of resistance because your level of accent is built up on your own personal experience. So I come from Johannesburg. I grew up in a state of war. When I would go shopping as a kid, you'd, have, you'd go through like, now when you go to an airport, that's what happens to us as, in South Africa. We'd go through metal detectors to go shopping because everybody was carrying bombs. Um, so I had d a different experience. I saw people being killed in front of me on the streets. I'd seen, I was detained by the police. I was in jail for my political opinion. Um, that gives me a different spin on my life and the world than somebody who had a different experience. And I'm not saying one is better or worse. I'm not going to try and create a mythology out of, um, out of a victim, victimization, no. I'm saying that my experience is different and that gives my work a different accent. And I don't want to function according to the same mor moral and value system as, as the European bourgeois collector, because I'm not that. So, I don't know if that really answers the question, but... Thank you very much. I suggest that we just have drinks for some 15 minutes <coughs> upstairs, and uh, I hope to see you back in 15 minutes for the hour. Thank you.